Bible study. We are on Zoom again uh, out of an abundance of caution. We want to pray for those, as Brother Kuhn mentioned, uh, in the path of Elza, uh, our neighbors, our family, friends in uh, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and beyond, that uh, they may be safe. A lot of times we take a tropical storm for granted because it's not a hurricane. Uh, but uh, we do need to take uh, necessary and adequate uh, precautions and out of an abundance of caution, we are back on Zoom tonight. So I hope you're all right with that. We want to begin our uh, Bible study where we left off on last week. We are in the book of Numbers. Welcome, Facebook family. Uh, amen to our midweek Bible study. We're in the book of Numbers. Uh, we're going to begin in chapter number 21. Uh, we concluded on last week, uh, we saw where Miriam died in uh, verse number one of chapter number 20. We saw where uh, Aaron and Moses uh, deviated from God's will. Uh, God told them to speak to the rock. Uh, they struck the rock. Uh, God's people were blessed with water. The people were complaining yet again. Uh, nevertheless, God disciplined Moses and Aaron. Aaron was stripped uh, from his uh, high priesthood, uh, went up on the mountain, and we see that Aaron died in verse number uh, 29 of that chapter. So we see Miriam die, we see Aaron die, uh, and in a little while we're going to see Moses pass on and Joshua take the helm. And so this is where we are at. We were talking uh, certainly about the children of Israel complaining, complaining, and complaining along the journey. Uh, and it hasn't stopped yet. So we're going to make some application on tonight uh, relative to our journey as children of God in this wilderness land called the world as we sojourn to our inheritance, making heaven our home in the presence of the Almighty throughout eternity. And so in Numbers chapter number 21 and verse number four, Numbers chapter 21 and verse number four, the Bible said, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of uh, the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. A few things in this uh, verse right here that I want to call to our attention. Of course, we're talking about this block of scripture between four and verse number nine with the bronze serpent and we're gonna get to that. But the first thing we need to uh, connect with is why they had to go around the land of Edom. Now, uh, for those of you who live in the low country of South Carolina, the Tri-County area, Berkeley, Dorchester, uh, and Charleston uh, County, it would be like coming from Charleston through North Charleston, you're headed to Mount's Corner, uh, but then you're unable to go the direct route, having to go around 26 and, and another direction uh, in order to get to Monk's Corner. Now, why is it that they had to go around the land of Edom? This is very interesting. Back up, if you will, to Numbers chapter number 20 and verse number 14. In Numbers chapter number 20 and verse number 14, listen to your Bible. The Bible said, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, uh, you know all the hardship that has befallen us. And so in this uh, brief text here, he sends a delegation, verse 14 through 21. Uh, and he's saying uh, that, that you're our brother. Edom, they come from Esau. Let me get somebody to get Genesis 36 and verse number eight. Genesis 36 and verse number eight. And so, you know, uh, Jacob and Esau, twin brothers, Jacob's name later on is changed by God to Israel. Uh, Esau went his way, uh, Israel or Jacob went his way. The people of Esau are the Edomites. And so Moses is writing uh, to the Edomites. He also sends a delegation to the Edomites and says that we need to pass through your territory. We're not going to eat any of your food. We're not going to come through your farmland. We're going to go through the king's highway. We're going to go, we're going to stay on the road. We're not going to deviate to the left, to the right. Uh, just allow us to pass. Uh, and he reminds them of the hardship that they have gone through the 400 years in uh, Egyptian bondage and all of the trials that they have endured. 
Let me get that reader in Genesis chapter 36 and verse number 8. Genesis 36 and verse number 8. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. All right. Esau is Edom. And so the Edomites, those are descendants from Esau. And this is why uh, Moses uh, leading the children of Israel uh, says, thus says your brother Israel. And so you would think your brother would let you pass on through. But we see uh, that they were not able to pass on through. Uh, Calls for Paul's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse number 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse number uh, 4. Let's see what uh, our Bible reads. Now, in Deuteronomy, we, uh, Moses uh, is talking to the second generation. Uh, first generation, 40 years in the wilderness, have passed away. Uh, he's talking to the second generation, and he's reminding them uh, of the journey thus far. And he says in verse number four, well, let's look at verse number one and following. Then we turn and journey into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted uh, Mount Sir for many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. Uh, amen. My point, verse 4. And command the people, saying, You are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of who? The descendants. Thank you now. Amen, somebody. The descendants of Esau who live in Seir, uh, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. All right. So uh, we see in the text that one of the reasons why Edom, um, the brother of uh, uh, Israel, the people, uh, they were afraid of their own folk. And so they did not allow them to pass through. Now, when we go back uh, to our text in chapter 21 of Numbers and verse number four, I want us to have, uh, I guess, a healthy respect for what the people were going through. We emphasize on several occasions um, how the children of Israel complain, complain, complain. And it seems like several times that they complain, they were disciplined. A lot of people lost their lives. Uh, they complained so much so that uh, God said, you'll not go into the promised land. They complained again and tried to go in anyhow, lost some folk. They complained with the rebellion uh, of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and, uh, and the 250 leaders, all of them passed. They complained the very next day, 14,000 plus uh, died in that rebellion. Uh, they complained so much, they got Moses, old humble Moses, so upset uh, he wanted, he hit the rock instead of hitting the people and God told him to speak to the rock. And so now he's disinherited from going into the land of Canaan. Uh, and so here we are in chapter 21 and verse number four. And so I say a healthy uh, appreciation for what they are going through. And so we see in verse number four that, that, that they had to go around the land of Edom. All right. And so this is not the direct route, uh, it would be like going out of your way 50, 100 miles, however so, um, to go further in the direction that you are going. So they had to go the long way. And there's no telling. They might have had to go through uh, uh, some swamp land. They might have had to go through a bunch of briars and bushes and all kinds of stuff. And so in the mind of the people, this is not what God had promised them. This is not um, what they had bargained for. Uh, several times as we look at the scripture, um, they began to feel like we were better where we were than where God is taking us. Now, why am I saying all this? Because I want us as children of God, those of you who have given your life to Christ through the obedience of the gospel, striving to walk with the Lord and under the new covenant, that's what we're under, the new covenant. We're learning from those things that are written aforetime, but we're under the new covenant, very much like their journey, our spiritual journey. Um, uh, we've been promised some great promises. 
Uh, we're headed toward uh, glory with the Lord. And, but nevertheless, um, this journey uh, is not the yellow brick road. And so many times when people come to Christ, uh, they feel like they're going from here to the destination, but there's a whole lot of territory in between that they're going to have to um, uh, navigate uh, with the help of the Lord. And Jesus said, I am the way, uh, if you will. Uh, and, and so the reason I bring this up in verse number four also, he said, uh, and the soul of the people became very discouraged along the way. Put a pin in it. I'm going to come back to that point. Look at Exodus chapter number three. Exodus chapter number three. Now, if you recall, when God introduced himself to Moses uh, at the burning of the bush, um, he told uh, Moses that, that I've come down to deliver God's people in verse number eight. Uh, out of the hand of the Egyptian. He says, I saw what they've been doing to you. He said, uh, amen, I, I want you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? Uh, he says, I am who I am. Y'all remember all of this. Drop down to verse number uh, 15. Verse number uh, 15. Look at, listen to your Bible. Verse number 15. Moreover, God said to Moses, here it comes. Uh, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your uh, fathers, the God of Abraham, yep, we know Abraham, God of Isaac, yep, and God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name uh, forever, and this is my memorial uh, to all generations, all right? Um, now he says in verse number 16, he says, uh, go and gather the elders of Israel together. Uh, he's commissioning Moses, go, go gather them together uh, and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. So I want you to put yourself in the place of, of God's uh, uh, burdensome people, enslaved people who have been suffering for 400 years under the whip and the lashes uh, of the Egyptians. And all of a sudden Moses shows up again and he says, you know what? God appeared to me and he says, I see what you're going through. All right. That's, that's, that's good to know because after 400 years, you wonder if God even knows what's going on. Now uh, he says in verse 17, he says, and I have, and I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and the Hitt uh, Hitt Hittites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, if you were uh, of the children of Israel, and here comes Moses, and Moses is saying, I talked to God, and God told me to tell you that he's ready to deliver you out of this land of Egypt. And not only is he going to deliver you from it, but he's going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this would be a message of great news, not just good news, but great news. Verse number 18, then they will heed your voice. So they're listening to Moses. Moses is saying that the God of your father's sees what you're going through, and he's going to deliver you uh, and transplant you from Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so this is the promise that they have been given. And so they, uh, to, to much extent, are, are sold on um, God's uh, plan for deliverance, his love, and his presence among them. Uh, chapter number four, drop down to verse 29. Uh, Exodus 4 and verse number 29. Listen to uh, your Bible. Then Moses and Aaron uh, went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So not only did he give them the word of God, but he performed signs in front of them. You all remember when 
He threw down the rod. Rod became a serpent. And so he did miraculous signs to confirm the fact that God indeed had sent them, Moses and Aaron, that the people of God might be delivered from uh, Egyptian bondage. Now, uh, in verse number uh, 31, uh, Exodus 4, 31, listen to your Bible. So the people did what? The people believed. They, they believed what uh, Moses and Aaron had said. They, they heard the words uh, from God's servants. Uh, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and did what? Worship. And worship. And so this is the message that they believed their hopes, their dreams, their hearts, their aspirations had become immediately elevated. God has seen us. He have come down to deliver us. We're going to have our own land. Uh, you know, he's going to move out the enemies and we're going to be in that land. And, and it's not any kind of land. It's a land of milk and honey. And so you are absolutely ecstatic. Now, spiritual application. When you become a child of God, uh, a lot of times we feel like the children of Israel, that I am saved, I'm going on to glory, praise ye the Lord, uh, and that's on Sunday. Then Monday show up. Uh, I said then Monday shows up. And, and, and on Monday, all of a sudden you find yourself <coughs> going through troubled trials and tribulations. You get discouraged, you get frustrated, um, and it seems like this is not what you signed up for. I signed up to be saved. I signed up to be delivered. Um, but what I'm going through uh, is not what I envision as it relates to God's purpose and plan for your life. And so many who are new in Christ um, say yes to the cross. And then it seems like no sooner did they say yes to the cross and become a child of God, all of a sudden it looked like all hell broke loose. Uh, my family going crazy. This going crazy. The job just let me go. Uh, I'm having problems with my account and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and what is going on? I did not sign up for this. Where is the Lord? And so it's very easy to become discouraged along the journey trying to make heaven your eternal home. And so while we look at the children of Israel and we uh, are amazed that they are complaining so much, we are amazed that they saw the Red Sea part go on dry land and yet they act as if God had forsaken them and they act as if it was better where they were than where they are. Uh, we too are on a journey and we need to connect with the fact that um, there are going to be trials, tribulations, and struggles along this journey, all right? Now, in Exodus chapter 13, in Exodus chapter number 13, why didn't God just take them directly to the promised land? Why didn't he just take them the short route there? It didn't have to take 40 years that, you know, it was 40 years because God's people had a hard heart. Um, they didn't go the direct route because uh, they weren't ready for where God was going to take them. And so I say this, understand this, that while there is discouragement uh, in this spiritual walk, this spiritual life uh, journey in which we are on trying to make heaven our eternal home, uh, trusting in the Lord, um, some discouragement is necessary. Some discouragement, church, is necessary. Now, some of it's unnecessary. Many times we bring some stuff on ourselves, but some discouragement is necessary uh, because God is trying to prepare us for where he's taken us and to help us become more like himself. In Exodus chapter number 13, and you look down around verse number 17, familiar text, listen to your Bible. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, he said that the Lord did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. 
That was the easy way. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds uh, when they see war and return to Egypt. What's going on? Uh, God could have took them the short route, but they were not ready for the short route. They, God is still working in our lives, conforming us, shaping, uh, and we're in that metamorphosis, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. There are some things about us that we need to let go. There are some things about us that needs to be um, worked out. And so while God can do, a, a do anything he desires to do, much of what God does is purposeful. And so we understand uh, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the what? Good, uh, for those that love the Lord, to the called according to his purpose. And so in verse 18 of Exodus 13, the Bible says, so God led. God is doing the leading. He's doing the direction. God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. All right. So they were led uh, a certain direction, uh, not the direct route, uh, because they weren't ready for where God was going to take them. Not only that, but God was also testing them to see if they would keep the faith. Would they trust in God? And so we need to recognize that in our wilderness journey, as we striving to make heaven our home, there are going to be some frustrations along the way, but we have to still trust in God, all right? And so discouragement is not um, um, uh, unique to um, certain Christians. Uh, discouragement uh, becomes a way of life uh, to an extent, to all Christians, we all become discouraged at some point along the way. And so it's important to recognize that as they got discouraged, we get discouraged. We can get discouraged by illness. We can get discouraged by uh, death. We can get discouraged uh, when uh, friends betray you or uh, reject you. You can get discouraged when you have a loss of hopes and dreams and aspirations uh, and all of these kinds of things. So there's a lot of things that have a tendency of discouraging us just as the children of Israel were discouraged along their journey. And so we have to, <clears throat> we have to understand that. Um, uh, so I want to mention a few folk that got discouraged. Sister um, Thomasina, I think your hand is up. God was just testing him. God was testing him. It was a test. Um, uh, but but we have a few other examples. Uh, how about Elijah? You all remember when Jezebel said that she was going to uh, kill Elijah, you know, 24 hours this time, the next day he was going to be, and he had to flee uh, from the Lord. Uh, if you're writing your notes, uh, 1 Kings 19 and 4, with Elijah and his discouragement. Uh, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Some of you have been to that same broom tree. Uh, amen. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. And now, Lord, uh, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. Um, Elijah got discouraged. If you remember David, David comes back to uh, his family and uh, amen, uh, uh, Ziglag, and it was burned down, and he didn't know what happened to his family in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30, 1 Samuel 30, about 1 through 6 or 7. Uh, and the Bible lets us know that David had to strengthen or encourage himself uh, in the Lord. And we have to learn, we have to learn that you haven't made it to the destination, but along the way, there's discouragement. And, and and you're not the first and you're not going to be the last. There are times you're going to have to encourage yourself as David did. There are times where God uh, reveals himself to you as he did with Elijah uh, and helped him to get right back on track. If you remember Rachel, uh, Rachel was a sister of Leah. 
uh, and Leah and Rachel uh, were there with uh, Jacob. Uh, and uh, Leah was having children left and right, popping them out, left and right, left and out. And Rachel was barren. Uh, and so in Genesis 30 and 1, uh, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jer Jacob no children, uh, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Uh, all right. So she was discouraged. And finally, just another example, we have Hannah. You remember uh, the prophet Samuel's um, uh, mother, Hannah, in 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 11, uh, and she was in bitterness of soul and, and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of uh, your maidservant and remember me and, for, and forget not your maidservant, but will give your maidservant, a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And so these are just four different examples of people of God that got discouraged. And as they got discouraged at various junctures in their journey with the Lord, you and I are going to get discouraged. And so when we look at the children of Israel, back to Numbers chapter uh, 21 and verse number four. I, I think I see a hand. Brother Ricky, is that your hand? Yeah. Um, brother, I was thinking about um, that Peter also got discouraged when he had denied God three times. Uh, then next when um, he saw Jesus again, he used to tell him to um, feed the flock, you know, yes. your brother, you know. Um, so I, I, that came to my mind. Oh, absolutely. That is an excellent example. Are there any other examples of discouragement that some of you that are with us uh, can connect with, maybe identify, or just comes to the top of your head? Uh, the reason I'm emphasizing and staying on this point is because when we get discouraged, the devil oftentimes has an opportunity to derail our continued journey with the Lord. We act as if we expect nothing to happen because we are children of God. I'm a child of God. Can't nothing happen to me. Uh, I'm on the Lord's side. And then all of a sudden something happens and you get bewildered in your Christian journey and the devil will deceive you into thinking that it was better where you were than where you're going. We see this play out time and time again among the children of Israel. They keep saying, I remember the melons. I remember the, the leeks. Uh, you should have left us there. It was better there than it was here. Now, part of that had to do with their appetites. Um, and, and, and part of that had to do with their lack of faith. But this is a uh, an example that we need to understand. We are not Im immune uh, to struggles in life, but we have to remember that struggles are the way of life for a child of God. Bible know all that desire to live godly must suffer persecution. Paul says, Romans 8, 18, uh, when I consider the sufferings of this life, they're not uh, worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Uh, and so we want the glory, but we don't want the suffering that comes prior to the glory as a requisite. Brother Coon. Yeah, that reminds me when I first came a Christian, I was in the Navy, uh, and I got orders to go away. I'm like, you know, I said, what in the world's going on? You know, I, was, I didn't want to leave. I said, I'm, I'm a new baby in Christ. You know, I, I mean, I was still sucking on the milk. <laughs> right. But uh, I, you know, I, I was sent away to uh, Connecticut, you know. Uh, and long story short, you know, God sent me away for me to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I went to the submarine, I had to be the religious leader for the ship. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn how to pray, how to uh, develop lessons, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, sing. <laughs> I, I couldn't sing, y'all, but you know, that God yeah. sent me away for me to grow, and I, I, I couldn't understand it when he when he first sent me away. I was like, man, why? You know, I, I said, you know, this is just a test. You know, I was like, man, I don't know why I had to go. I was trying to fight from leaving. My family, I'm like, man. But uh, when I came back, I was like, you know, 
I was a, a better vessel and more right. prepared vessel for the Lord. So I kind of look at it, you know, like, man, you know, I didn't want to go, but I was fighting against what God wanted, you know, for me to do what I had to do for him to use me later on. Well, outstanding, outstanding example. What happens when your plans are not God's plans? <laughs> what, 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 what happens when your plans are not God's plans? Oftentimes, we, we, we're looking at the goal, uh, but we forget the journey. And as we look at this, these children of Israel, and, and we, we're looking at them, and, and we can be very critical of them. Uh, we can see where they went wrong. It's hard to believe some of the things that they have done. But guess what? It's hard to believe some of the things we do. It's hard to believe some of the things that we do when we got the word. We have the word. We have the answers um, uh, to, to all of life's issues in compass in God's word. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. So uh, we're not going through this journey blind. You know, that's why we have to study the word of God so that we might see. But what happens is, although we are taking the test, and although we got the answers to the test, how many times have we failed the test? Come on. Come on. How many times have we failed the test? So, so we're looking at Israel, and we say, wait a minute, you saw the Red Sea? You came through on dry land? Uh, you got the uh, pillar of fire of the Lord at night and the pillar of cloud by day? You see the Lord? How could you do that? Well, we got the word of God and we got, uh, amen, I mean, 1,500 plus years uh, of answers to life struggles. And the Bible is right. There's no new thing under the sun. So when you got the test, you got the answers to the test and you still fail the test? Yes, sir. Either something's wrong with us, <laughs> you know, you know, or, or, or uh, the journey is formidable. We are on a journey and the devil's not going to make it easy. He is a formidable foe, but greater is he who is in us than he that's in the world. And so God is dwelling in each and every child of God. So we have the Holy Spirit. We have his holy word. We have the fellowship of the saints, uh, and then we want to be any place but but the fellowship and but worship and but Bible study, and then wonder why we can't, why we're struggling on the way to um, to the goal, making heaven our home. Sister Thomasina, I think I see your hand up. Okay, and um, instead of when we go to our trials and tribulation and things to go our way, we have to still learn how to worship and praise the Lord, and that's what the sermon was about Sunday, bringing your worship. Yeah. Yes. And, and some people don't do. A lot of people don't do that. That's why they straight away from church now. And look at Job. Look what he went through. And That's he right. Still worship and praise the Lord after he lost his family, his home, and stuff. If he could do it, we could do it. Oh, you're absolutely right. And and so sometimes when we worship the Lord, you you wonder if God had done anything good for some of us. You know, when you're in worship and you can't worship, uh, what has happened? to your spirit that I can't yes. praise God properly, uh, you know, in a uh, friendly, if you will, conducive environment uh, among the saints of God, worshiping God in the presence of God. And all I can think about is what I'm going through. <laughs> so, so that's telling us that this journey we are on is not that un- familiar to the journey they were on. Now, the difference is we saw what they did. We see where they went wrong. Uh, but are we making a course correction so that we don't repeat the, 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 the mistakes of uh, God's people in the past? And so it's very important that we understand that discouragement is part of the journey. Uh, but God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, God is with us. Uh, if God be for you, who can be against you? And, and so, you know, we have to be people of faith in this life and in this journey. I'll give us an example really quick and then I'll get Sister Gigi. Uh, let me tell you how fast your joy can be stolen. Y'all got time for this? 
I go to the store, um, shopping. I had to get some stuff, get some stuff. And um, so, you know, I'm trying on some stuff and got to get some things altered and all this kind of stuff. I get to the register and I don't have my wallet. Mm. And I said, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Hold on a second. So I said, wait a minute, let me go to the dressing room. I might have left my wallet. It might have fell out my pocket or something in there. You know, you know, you lose your wallet. I got too much stuff in there. Um, wallet wasn't in there. Well, thank God I was able to use my little Apple phone and go ahead and secure the purchase and go. But my countenance had fallen so fast. Uh, I mean, just it went from a hundred to zero really fast. I had to talk to the Lord all the way home. All I could think of was somebody stole my wallet. I might have lost my wallet. I got to cut off my credit cards and all kinds of stuff. I don't know how to replace this place that certain things might be missing. Everything had went down and I had to uh, pray on the way and I had to resolve in my mind that even if I lost it, I'm going to be all right. I got my health. Amen. You know, uh, yeah. God, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Okay, fine. So I had to really work to get my spirit back. Got to the house. My wallet was right where I keep my wallet and my keys, same place. It be it uh, baffled me because I had my keys but didn't have my wallet. And I, ain't no rookie. I don't lose stuff. But it was strange for me to have one and not the other. And so it really messed with my faith. And I'm talking about Monday after Sunday. Uh, and... and <laughs> And, and I got so discouraged just that fast. And so I get home, you know, I, I got my faith up about 30%, you know, found my wallet, praise you the Lord, I was feeling better. But I had to accept the fact that even if it wasn't there and I lost it, God is still good. Even though I, I don't have my wallet and, and all kinds of things can happen and inconvenience, uh, amen. The Lord is still with me, you know. And so I say that to say this, little things happen. And, and you don't think it's little when it happens in your life. But these things happen yeah. and you go from Sunday to Saturday. You, you know, you go from here to here just that fast. And we have to remember that you're going to go through trials, tribulations, but Thank be the Lord that I'm better here than where I was when I was in the world. How many of you have felt like in the world? I didn't have no struggles. I've become a Christian. Now all of a sudden I got all kinds of struggles. Everything is coming out the woodworks and hitting me left, right, and center. And, and I don't know. It just seemed like I had it less trouble when I was in the world than I do as a child of God. You have to know that you're in a much better situation as a child of God than you were back in Egypt. Because if you don't uh, process that, then as soon as you hit a bump in the road, you want to go where? Back to Egypt. Nobody wants stress. Nobody wants discouragement. Nobody wants trials, troubles, and tribulations. You didn't sign up for that. You signed up for pearly gates. You signed up for salvation. You signed up to be on the clouds in the presence of God. You didn't sign up to go through the wilderness to get there. And so we have to very much understand, realize, and um, and and fortify yourself in the faith. Otherwise, the devil will take advantage of you and you will be right back where you came from. And uh, in the worst, uh, uh, you know, the latter is worse than the beginning. Sister Thornton. Good evening. grow as Christians in the Lord, those things like that, you have to remember to praise. And I'm not saying that I'm, I'm there yet because I'm not, because little things like that happen to me, and I just I try to look for the good, good in it. But no matter what, he says, praise him. Praise him anyway. Amen. You know, and Amen. that's his word, so who are we to deny that? You know, it took me a while to get that one. You know, but when we praise... 
we break down a lot of barriers and we don't even realize it. So I think when we in, in corporate worship that when you sit on your praise, that praise could be helping somebody else. Be helping the person sit next to you. That's right. You just can't, you just can't, you just can't be quiet. You, I mean, you know, if you know that God, if he, whether he did a little or a lot, I'm getting excited, I'm sorry. Whether he did a little or a lot for you, it's just something to praise him for. There's a lot of feedback. Gigi, is there noise in your background? I'm sorry, yes it is. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a little, it's a little difficult to hear you. Um, but absolutely right, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, that's why when we come into worship, you know, it's very important that you are in worship. Just because your body is there, don't mean that you're there. And, and so, it's very important that when we come to worship, we are completely there. Um, and, and through worship. And taking your mind off your problems uh, and putting your mind on your praise and on God, we can get through to the other side. All right, I'm going to expedite just a few things. Let me give us a few strategies for overcoming uh, discouragement. Wrote down a few things. Number one, uh, when you are discouraged, be a blessing to somebody else. Are y'all with me? Be a but it's not all about you. Be a blessing to someone else. In other words, change your focus, all right? When, you get, when you're getting frustrated and discouraged, change your focus. Number two, uh, remember that beneath your burdens are blessings. Beneath your burdens are blessings. Uh, Philippians 1 and 12, Philippians 1 and 12, beneath your bless burdens are blessings. Now, uh, number three, Rest a while. Uh, physical and emotional exhaustion is not good. Need to rest a while. Even Jesus rested. Mark 6, 31. Mark 6, 31. Rest a while. Got to give your mind, your body, and your spirit need rest. Sometimes we work to exhaustion and then wonder why we can't go another mile. All right? Uh, number three. Number four. Block out evil thoughts. Block out evil thoughts. Do not give the devil room to sow seeds in the heart of your mind. And you got to pray for strength. Just like David uh, encouraged himself in, in the Lord, we have to do that. But you got to block out evil thoughts. Uh, number five, don't forget that you're never alone. Do not forget that you're never alone. All right. Uh, Hebrews 13 and 6, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Okay. Uh, number six, the Holy Spirit gives us the strength that we need to endure. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength that we need to endure. Ephesians 3 and 16. And lastly, God is with you and comforts you. You remember David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so just a few um, uh, pillars, guidance to help us in our times of discouragement. All right, let's move a little bit further in our in our text here very quickly. Uh, if, uh, no, numbers 21 We're going to start at verse 5 uh, Somebody had a comment hey, Can you give me Number 2 again Okay number 2 is Philippians 1 and 2 Remember that beneath your burdens There are blessings Philippians 1 and 12 I don't know if I said 2 or 12 Philippians 1 and 12 Philippians 1 and 12 Thank you Okay yes ma'am Okay now, in Numbers 21, in verse number 5, and the people, this is after they got discouraged, they had to go the long way. Nobody wants to go the long way. Why we got to go over our elbow and over the valley and through the woods when we can just go straight through this land? But they said no, and so God's people had to go the long way. Nobody wants to go the long way. So they began to speak out against God and Moses, verse 5. Uh, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? This is the, the classic uh, complaint again 
for there is no uh, for there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. My soul detests this worthless bread. They're calling God's food cheap bread. It's worthless. You gave us cheap bread. You, you, you call yourself feeding us? This, this, what is this stuff you've given us? And matter of fact, my soul, I can't eat another, you know, have you ever ate something so much that you don't want it no more? Yes. yes. How, how, how many of you have been to Chick-fil-A so much that you don't want nothing else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I ain't never did that. Keep 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 eating that bird. Keep eating that bird. All right. So so there comes a time when, you know, I've had so much of this, I can't take no more. We've cooked it, we've fried it, we've grilled it. You know, I don't want none of it anymore. It's worthless bread. And they're talking about God's provision. All right. Uh, verse six. So the Lord sent fiery serpents. That'll wake you up. Uh, among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died verse 7 therefore the people came to Moses and said we have sinned after 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 so many people died for we have spoken against the Lord and against you pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us so Moses prayed for the people again Moses uh, a type of Christ a mediator intercessor uh, on behalf of the people so Moses uh, prayed for the people that were dying as a result of the serpent. So, see, you know, you might be in the wilderness. But you don't know how God is protecting you even in that wilderness. They're in the wilderness. You know there's snakes all in there, but God is protecting you from danger seen and unseen. But then when you disrespect God, disregard God, act like you don't need God, God will remove his hedge of protection and allow things that are right there to touch you. Serpents, amen, were able to touch them. Verse number eight, listen to your Bible. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. All right. So they disrespected God. God had a remedy uh, for uh, the plague uh, via the fiery serpents, the venomous serpents. You know that they were shaking and hurting uh, and dying uh, as a result of uh, these vipers. Let me get somebody to get uh, Psalm 2 and verse 12. Psalm 2 and verse 12. Need a reader very quickly. All right. Um, so he says, when the people looks uh, at it uh, shall live. Psalm 2 and 12, what does your Bible read? Kiss his son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. All right, so so he says, uh, kiss the son, uh, embrace, honor the son, honor God, uh, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled a little, uh, but a little. Blessed are, are all those who put their trust in him. These folk didn't trust God. And, and so when we look at this uh, passage of scripture in our text, Numbers 21, um, you know, they had disrespected God, called his bread worthless, cheap bread. Uh, they didn't honor God. And, and so God was displeased with them and allowed them vipers uh, to afflict them. Many of them died. Verse number nine, Numbers 21. So Moses made a bronze serpent uh, and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a, a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Uh, all right. So when we think about uh, the serpent in spiritual terms, what comes to your mind? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, here's a hint. Um, Genesis 3. When you think about a serpent, spiritually, what comes to your mind? 
Okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Satan. Yes. All right. All right. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. So you remember the sa- sa- the serpent in Genesis three was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. All right. And so we are living in this world, and the Bible lets us know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have been bitten by what? The serpent. The serpent. We, we've all been bitten by the serpent. There is a plague, a spiritual plague that has impacted all humanity. Now, if you're going to be uh, saved from the plague uh, that have been ha- have afflicted us, uh, motivated by the devil, we choose the sin. Uh, we got to look. Uh, to that serpent. We, we got to look up. So John chapter number three, Jesus speaks about and makes reference to this occasion. You all are familiar with this. In John chapter number three and verse number uh, four, 14, John three and 14, listen to your Bible, John three and 14. Uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is Jesus talking, even so, the Son of Man must be what? <laughs> lifted up. John 12 and 32, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men uh, unto me. If I be crucified, I'll draw all men uh, unto me. And so the people had to look at the very thing that was um, that had bitten them and that was um, terrorizing them and uh, horrified uh, by all these serpents going among the people, and and you know they were just a hopping and a jumping, and 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 you know snakes can go up trees. I mean, where are you going? Uh, and some of them snakes are fast, uh, and you know, um, it, you know, it, it just terrorized the people. And then, in order to be healed, you got to look at the same thing that is terrorizing you. And so we're living in a world where mankind has been impacted by sin um, through the work of the devil or the serpent, Um, but you can be healed, but you got to look to the sun. And so Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men uh, unto me. He says, amen, even as Moses lifted up the serpent, the son of man must be lifted up. And so... This is very important for us to understand. The only reason uh, we have an opportunity to live in spite of um, our transgression is to turn to Jesus. And so when we look in John chapter number six, you know, they were talking about Moses, uh, talking about God's worthless bread and all of that. So in John chapter number six, and verse number, um, verse number thirty-one, John six and thirty-one. Uh, our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. And so Jesus is the bread of life. And so our nourishment comes from the Lord. Everything we need comes from and through the Lord. Uh, And so Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. Uh, Jesus is the answer to our uh, daily nourishment, our daily bread problem. Uh, And then when we talk about uh, life and the consequence uh, of uh, sin, which is death, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of God is what? 
eternal life in Christ. Now, uh, amen, somebody. Um, lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 55, because the wages of sin is death. In other words, you're going to get, uh, you know, there, there's a there's a price uh, for sin, and that's death. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 15 and 55, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death, talking about the viper, Satan. Sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us what? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, church, immovable, church, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. Um, how are we doing on time? Amen. It's time. All right. All right. Good. Um, uh, I have some outline uh, lessons and some fill in the blanks that deal with this part of scripture and the next section that we're going to deal with. Uh, so it deals with from Miriam to the death of Moses. And it's kind of a review of some of the things that we have been studying. And so you got the, uh, the question and you got the fill in the blank, but it also gives you the scripture so that you can study on your own, become refreshed, um, become more connected with our study up to now and to prep you for next week's study. Uh, and if you're interested in that, uh, just go ahead in the comment box and let me know if you want that. And what I'll do is I'll email it to you. But if you don't say nothing, you ain't getting nothing. Now, if you're on... <laughs> if, if, yeah, see, see, that ain't going to happen. I just said... <laughs> put it in the comment box and, and, and we'll get you taken care of. Now, if you're not uh, a member of this beloved congregation, the Church of Christ in Goose Creek, and if you're joining us, they're still on Facebook? You cut them off? Oh, uh, on Facebook then go ahead and uh, indicate your email address and we will send you uh, those review lessons. Uh, it, it's only about nine pages, but they're, they're questions. Some of them are fill in the blank. And then I have some multiple, um, multiple choice stuff and some matching stuff. But it is an excellent review. And um, we want everybody to really be engaged with this study that we are doing this wilderness journey, the journey uh, from the wilderness to Canaan. I want you to be in touch with this. Um, and so it's very important that you um, uh, put your work in and, and you'll be encouraged. So we'll do all of that. All right. Amen, somebody. I heard all kind of voices. I'm glad you're encouraged. 